Hi, everyone, and thanks very much for being with us. Uh, we will just give it a, a minute or so for any uh, latecomers to click in, and then uh, and then we'll get going. So just hold tight for a couple of minutes, please. All right, I think we will get moving. Um, thank you so much to everyone who has joined us today for our webinar. Um, considering we were just saying before opening up that considering that the invite went out uh, within the last 10 days or so, and looking at the numbers that we have online today, there's no doubt there's a lot of interest in what we'll be talking about and what, uh, what Ian will be taking us through. Uh, I'm Phil Cartwright. I am very happy to serve as the chair of Siltma's Ottawa chapter. Uh, I know that we have people coming to this from across the country. I'm coming to you today from Ottawa, the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin people. Sildna is very pleased to have a guest speaker today with us from Tech Resources, uh, which as many will know is the largest uh, diversified Canadian mining company and is a key player in our country's economic activity, most particularly in Western Canada. I am thrilled our guest speaker agreed to participate today in the midst of what I know is a really busy time. Um, so as you'll have seen in our invite, Ian Anderson, who's with us, is a member of Tech's leadership team, and he serves as Tech's Senior Vice President and Chief Commercial Officer, a role that he moved into earlier this year. Ian has deep experience in transportation and logistics and most recently served as Tech's Vice President Logistics, where he oversaw the coordination and planning for the company's overall logistics strategy, no small feat. Today's presentation for me and centers on an initiative that's inspired by Tech's overall commitments to sustainability and supply chain optimization and is born from the tremendous work of Ian and uh, many of his colleagues at Tech. And I know uh, some of them are on the line today too. I won't go into detail as that's what Ian's here for, but what we're talking about is a new North Pacific Green Corridor connecting Canada and key markets in the Indo-Pacific. So very exciting stuff. Uh, this is something that is generating significant interest on both sides of the ocean. And in fact, Ian, we were just talking about jet lag. Uh, Ian has just recently returned from Isashima, Japan, where he and Tech were invited by the Federal Minister of Transport to join him and the Canadian delegation so that they could present their court of vision to the G7 members who were attending the transport minister's meeting. I'm going to leave it there. And with that, just say a big thank you again, Ian, for making the time for this. It's much appreciated. Uh, just for everybody who's tuned in, please know we'll have time following Ian's presentation for some questions. So if I could just encourage everyone to use the um, the QA function to share them if you have them, and then I'll go through them as they arrive. Um, Ian, over to you. Thanks again. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope you're well, and, and thank you for attending today. It certainly is an honor uh, to, to speak with Siltman. And, and as Phil said, I, I was just lying last night re recounting of uh, the history of, of uh, my time in logistics. And I came to this shocking realization, which is that I've spent about a third of my career in logistics and have never thought of myself as having that much logistics expertise, but I would hope after seven years or so of that, that I've accumulated a little bit. So it's, it's an honor to speak with this group, considering uh, both your expertise and the importance in terms of the national economy and, and many of the functions that you're engaged in. So Phil, can, can you see my screen now? Yeah, okay, that's super. So I would like to start by describing a problem. And this is one that has been sharply illustrated 
over this last year as geopolitics has changed so fundamentally. And so the problem I describe is that the race for global energy and critical mineral security is on. It's happening all around us. But there's a problem with that race. And that's that climate and the need to reduce our total carbon emissions cannot be the loser. And what that would create, if it is the case, is a bleak landscape of global haves and have nots with the common problem that environmental conditions are going to worsen each and every day. And that's not a future that any of us want. And so really the essence of this presentation is that we're in a time of cooperation, a need for public-private collaboration, and certainly not in a situation where one company, one entity, one nation is going to solve what's ahead of us. So in my presentation, I'd like to first of all introduce my organization, Tech, introduce our innovative approach to critical mineral, minerals, and then lastly, as Phil mentioned, the North Pacific Green Corridor, which I'll suggest goes to the heart of the problem that I described here. So let's just talk about tech for a moment. Uh, tech's a different kind of mining company. So our purpose, as you see it here, is to supply essential resources that the world is counting on. And we really feel that that makes life better. But it comes with a dual responsibility. At the same time, while we provide those resources to the world, we care deeply about the people in the organization and that surround it, their communities, and the land that we love. And when we say land, we mean the natural environment. And that is very, very important to It's fundamental to what we do. And so we are focused on copper production. And that, of course, is integral to the energy transformation. So we're currently amongst the world's top 20 global copper producers. And as you can see in that north-south map, we really operate from our, our farthest operation in the north, Red Dog, Alaska, uh, down into Chile. We're, we're Americas based. Uh, so all of our operations are in the Americas. And just calling your attention to spot number three on that graphic, that is the Cabrada Blanca operation. And very excitingly, we produced just in the last days, first concentrate for sale. We actually loaded that onto a truck and it's an extremely exciting time. We've invested over $7 billion in that operation. And when it's complete, uh, it will put us amongst the top 10 global copper producers. And behind that, we have a growth pipeline really focused on green and future metals. And that's where we're going. That's, I, I think, what we offer the world is that chance to expand and grow. But we also produce zinc and steel making coal. Both of those are used in the steel industry. So there's a lot involved in building green transition infrastructure that's supported, for example, by galvanization in zinc. Galvanized steel lasts something like twice or three times as long as existing steel. And so you extend the life cycle, life cycle and essentially need to make less steel. Steel making coal, of course, is involved in the overall energy transition. It helps with building windmills. It helps with building solar arrays. And certainly the large grid infrastructure change that's occurring will take a lot of steel to complete. So as I said, we operate in the Americas, but our customer base is global. We ship to commodities at every point in the world, but particularly we have a very strong and long-standing relationship and by long standing, I mean some over 50 years in length in Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and also Europe. And so when I talk to geopolitics, it's interesting as you start to see those trade networks become increasingly important to Canada. Those trade networks have been highlighted as being significant in terms of the new ge geopolitical reality. And so tech has a comprehensive strategy around sustainability. And we have goals that stretch out to 2050. And so we're focused both on local issues like water and tailings and health and safety, but also on things that are more boundaryless, like climate and nature and human rights. And we have been recognized as a global sustaining sustainability leader. So we're the first company that's actually set a nature positive goal by 2030. 
And that is all about our effect on biodiversity uh, and ability to change that based on the lands that we're both directly involved in, but also have in proximity to our operations, either far afield, pertains to the ocean as well. We've been internationally recognized for our sustainability leadership, and we are the top ranked mining company on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. And that was just confirmed as well. And, you know, we've won a number of awards globally uh, in terms of our sustainability process. So our climate change strategy really starts with a focus on producing metals and minerals, as I said, and that's involved in building of wind and solar and EV, but based on, you know, in part, uh, some natural assets, which is that in British Columbia, with hydroelectric power, uh, that makes us one of the lowest carbon intensity mining operations in the world. But we've also taken specific steps for that. So, for example, at Cabada Blanca, uh, we engaged in, a, in an agreement there that by the end of 2025, we'll have all of the electricity requirements uh, for that operation supplied based on renewables. And that's very rare in Chile. Similarly, at Cabrada Blanca, for example, we chose to use no water from the natural environment. What we've done instead is constructed a desalination plant uh, at the ocean at our port that transports desalinated water up to the mine, 165 kilometers in length, this pipeline, and in return, the product flows back down to that port. So no water being used from the natural environment. So we're also reducing our supply chain emissions across key areas of both marine rail transport, really based on both commercially sensible transactions, but also on transitionary technologies. And so I'll give you some examples of that. So we engaged uh, early on in an energy efficient bulk carrier deal with one of the large ship owners. And so over the last two years on over 2 million tons of product, we've achieved 41% emission savings uh, simply through the use of eco vessels built post 2015 uh, based on slow steaming and working on upsizing to ensure that we have maximum capacity there. Uh, we also have engaged in a capital deal associated with bringing electric tugboats to our Neptune terminals. So what that will do is for delivery at the end of this year, we'll see two tugs. They will service our Neptune terminal exclusively. Uh, they 100% use uh, hydroelectric power. And part of our arrangement there is that they'll be used in that electric mode exclusively to serve uh, the Neptune terminal. And finally, and, and this is a landmark that we're very proud of, uh, CPKCS uh, has been describing this in their recent earnings call. We are just very, very happy to be partnered together, uh, but we've agreed on a pilot uh, to co-develop the use of hydrogen locomotives uh, in, the, in the coal service. And you know, I, it, CPKCS is an ideal partner for that. And it's great to see them partnered with a customer. I think they just uh, announced a, another agreement with a railroad. So we are the first customer and we're the first in North America that will be using hydroelectric or hy hydrogen powered locomotives. So let's just talk, I, I think, to the subject that people are very interested. What does our supply chain look like? Uh, and we have been engaged in a transformation there. So uh, for many years, this was a very stable supply chain. It has large volumes in it. So we transport about 26 million tons per annum. It's a you know, absolutely staggering number when you think about it. When it's a, on a unit train basis, it's something like five unit trains, 152 cars uh, leaving the operations in Southeastern British Columbia every day. Uh, that, of course, gets transported to the coast, uh, primarily to our Neptune terminals, but also to West Shore, sometimes to Ridley. Uh, and then we also, of course, have the copper and zinc uh, supply chains, which occur on a manifest basis. So for tech overall, we spend about $1.5 billion annually on transportation. And we came to a realization, and I, I'm sure this is one that all of you wrestle with significantly. Sometimes these chains are not reliable. Sometimes you need to build in buffer capacity. Sometimes you need to look at your investments on the terminal side and say, are they function optimally? Can we in fact support the supply chain through greater investment in those terminals to make sure that we have that capacity when we need it? And so interestingly, on a commercial basis, you know, while we only produce 26 million tons per year, 
we have options for port capacity that take us all the way up to 32 million tons. And we use that buffer capacity when we need it. If there's a disruption of Fraser Corridor, for example, we'll route north. Sometimes we've even routed south, right? And so those multiple routings allow us to consistently move our product. And we recently engaged MOT and we've worked with both CN and CP on where we really think the targeted areas for disruption are within that supply chain. In particular, Fraser Canyon and the Fraser Corridor is one that we're concerned about. We've identified each of those and we'll now work with the railways uh, around solutions there. And you know, it goes without saying, when we uh, engaged in the transformation, we were willing to invest in Neptune as a terminal. So we've spent about just over a billion dollars on making that a top class facility. It's a high efficiency terminal and you know we're pulling out berth occupancy numbers that are we think uh, certainly North American and, and definitely world class uh, in terms of how you're turning over vessels there. And we did that by supporting it with new equipment uh, and really focusing on performance at the terminal. And what we found as soon as we implemented this at Neptune is that in fact stabilized the whole supply chain. We felt a little bit and you know rail and, and ourselves had had this conversation that we were pushing things that you know you just weren't able to handle from the terminal capacity and by expanding neptune and allowing that to come in as high performance it really fundamentally changed what we do but at the same time that we made those improvements we also focused on digital improvements and so for a while we've had automated rail loading at the sites uh, but we engaged in a large ai based optimization process and so through a variety of systems we have very good visibility we have gps uh, on all of our cars so we can see where every train is in the network at any time we have uh, a system of course of cameras which many of you are aware of that gives us a sense of what's occurring in the corridor uh, we know exactly what the mines are producing we know what's in silos we know what's at the terminals all of those systems are linked together and this ai optimization process actually seeks to deliver product from the operations all the way through to the vessel and it does that based on value maximization so it is constantly running optimization scenarios in the background believe it or not this stuff used to be done on a spreadsheet right? it was done by people working on those calculations and we knew that we'd actually reached that nirvana state uh when the machine started making better decisions than the people with that deep experience it was a phenomenal process i'm not going to say it was easy it took us about a year and a half to build this system. Uh, it took a lot of dedication and mostly it took people who were involved in the actual process, trial and error, working through bugs. So phenomenal to see that come to bear. And lastly, just in terms of Neptune, uh, it is our goal to decarbonize that terminal. And the way that we're gonna do that is really focus on the last little pieces that they have used in terms of fuel. So the dozers that they have on site, the, the pickups that they have on site, work to use that and create it sustainably. sustainably. So between the power that they use, which is hydroelectric, and the, and the terminals tugs now, which will be electric, we think it'll be one of the first terminals to decarbonize on the West Coast. Very, very exciting. So I've established tech as an organization. I talked about our credentials in terms of sustainability, and I'd like now to move to the North Pacific Green Corridor. So this is a vision. It's a 2050 vision, so that's long term. And so we do believe that this actually stands apart. You're probably hearing a lot about green corridors. Here's why this one is different. And I'll take you through each of these figures in order. So I'll draw your attention just to figure one. And that begins with the transport our existing commodities. And as I described, with just the tech traffic alone, you're talking about a platform commercially of 26 million tons per year. The interesting part about the way those volumes move is that they're very, very stable. They're consistent. They don't run up and down, and they're going from single port locations where they're loaded out to single discharge locations in South Korea and Japan. And it's this stability, I think, that probably sets us apart. You're not moving to different locations in the world. You have this as your basis, right? It varies very little. It's a solid platform. And so those low carbon commodities. Uh, are subject right now to transitionary technologies, as we talked about, things like slow steaming. But eventually, as we see new engine technologies and new fuel technologies online, it's much easier to bring those into that movement, 
right, to introduce pilot vessels run on ammonia or green methanol, to put them in service there, to engage in long-term contracts, for example, 10 years to support the capital that's required to do that. And we think others are gonna be able to do that as well. But then, you know, I turn to, to figure two. And in Western Canada, we're blessed with the means to produce significant quantities of ammonia and other low carbon fuels. This energy transition is occurring. There are investments occurring within it right now. And we have the ability to use our existing rail port and marine infrastructure to support that movement. And so for example, you'll see in a second, Trigon Terminals is involved in the North Pacific Green Corridor to us. The proximity that they have to those future production facilities and the ability to bunker at that location, very, very interesting. At the same time, we know that globally, and in particular in South Korea and Japan, as they begin to transition away from using thermal coal, they have a significant energy deficit. So for example, uh, we have a, a current customer that we deal with that imagines themselves and sees this as part of their future business plan, that they'll be something like a five to seven million ton hydrogen consumer within the next 10 years. It's, it's a staggering number when you think about it. And there is just not the ability based on restrictions in terms of energy availability or with the natural resources that they have for that to be produced within Japan and South Korea. And this has grown to the level where both national governments in Japan and South Korea have said, look, we're declaring it. We know that there's this deficit. We're out in the world looking for opportunities. Canada, based on our existing trade partnerships, is an ideal partner in this future energy use. You know, there's short routing in terms of getting there. We trust and know the players very well. And hence, you're starting to see things percolate through in terms of bilateral trade agreements, et cetera. And so finally, I'll just turn. So what we're saying is that the export of low carbon fuels will become a feature of Canada's economy going forward. And it's a significant number. I'll show you it in a second. It's something like between 10 and $70 billion as it evolves. So finally, and, and this is why it's a 26 or 2050 vision, looking at figure four, uh, CO2 is still a problem. CO2 is a problem in terms of sequestration in Western Canada, as we produce that green energy. Tech's actually just broken ground on a carbon capture uh, pilot program that we have a trail that deals with sequestration. We're aware of very, very interesting sequestration opportunities uh, within the mafic rock that we have in Western Canada. We're also talking, for example, with companies that are doing offshore sequestration and have identified opportunities for that. So you could see, and again, you're starting to see carriers built. This is the most nascent uh, of all of these pieces, but CO2 eventually will move around the globe. Whether it actually makes it from South Korea to the ocean or back to Canada, uncertain, but definitely this ability to move CO2 around and sequester it will be very, very important. So that's the vision. So we feel that the North Pacific Green Corridor is unique amongst such global efforts. And that's why it's received so much support from the industry. So we've modeled these future energy exports. And we believe that the volumes of e-methanol and ammonia from Canada to Japan alone will be nearly 10 billion. When you look at overall Asia, we think it's about 70 billion. And we see this as an effort really to enhance the decarbonization effort on behalf of Canada. This is a path to net zero. And we think that the Green Corridor will in fact accelerate bilateral trade at a time when the world deeply needs it. And we think we can do this in the most sustainable way possible. Now, people might ask, you know, what's tech's role in this? And, you know, we are keeping our eye on future economic opportunities but we don't actually see ourselves as a direct player at this point. We actually see ourselves as a catalyst growing an ecosystem, which is both good for the nation, but will be good for the companies that surround us in the future. So it's a bit of a different approach than has been seen traditionally. So this is where things get interesting. So to date, what we've done is established a not-for-profit consortium of key industry stakeholders. You can see the early entrance to this and there are some big names associated with it. So Tech, NYK, of course, a large Japanese ship owner, POSCO, uh, the largest steel maker in Korea, Oldendorf, a large European ship owner, Trigon, the terminal, Cargill and CN are the initial companies that have signed into the LOI uh, that's involving this not-for-profit consortium. 
You take those companies alone on an enterprise value basis, you've got something like $360 billion. Uh, we intend to involve other players. Um, and we think by the time the consortium is fully established, we'll have something to the order of about half a trillion in terms of enterprise value involved here. So a couple of larger players still to come in uh, and we're in discussions around that right now. So we think the entrance will grow to something like 12 or 15 organizations involved. And that'll of course plan or span the entire supply chain. And so the consortium is actively consulting with other relevant stakeholders uh, with more to come. So both port authorities in Japan and Western Canada, First Nations and Indigenous peoples. And as Phil talked about, we also have strong governmental support. So federal transport has been engaged. And, and as you heard, uh, they were the ones that invited us to Japan and, and to speak at the G7. So the reason we've chosen uh, a not-for-profit structure is because we feel it's optimal for the corridor. And what it does is it allows the facilitation of the development of the corridor without having to actually engage in direct commercial agreements. We see the commercial agreements as clustered and occurring you know, between the partners, with other partners, with the consortium as the center of it, right? So that means you have the commercial discussions outside of it, the consortium is free to act both on its own and also without the threat of competition law, for example, uh, interfering with the process. And so this is the track that we're on. Uh, we began the first discussions in November and we actually held the CEO roundtable in December. Uh, we presented it on June 17th at the G7. Uh, we're finalizing the list of consortium members uh, out till June 30th. And then we're actively involving uh, everybody in the design. And so we've got a pretty clear sense of what's involved from the major buckets of work. Uh, and of course, they include things like fuel pathways, the technologies, implementation costs, hurdles, and what we're setting for the benchmarks in terms of reduction. And following that, as well as the transitionary technologies, we work to implement the corridor itself. So that is what I had for everyone today. And you know, welcome the opportunity and, and look forward to answering your questions. Terrific, Ian, thank you very, very much for taking everybody through that. Um, uh, extremely exciting. So maybe I'll start off and then I just, again, encourage everybody, if you do have questions, please put them into the Q&A and, uh, and I'll go through them. Um, so maybe to start with, again, just because you're so kind of hot off the, uh, the G7 presentation, to the extent that you can, um, can you describe a little bit what that kind of dialogue is like when you know, in terms of how those different countries are approaching these issues, but then once it comes to the table, and particularly when they have a commercial player like tech, they're presenting something like this. Just describe it, you know, for people like me who weren't who weren't there. Yeah, so so it really interesting, and and everybody in transportation will like this. So uh, the main G seven happens, you know, on its regular schedule, and then based on. Uh, functions beneath that there are separate ministers meetings and so this was actually the transport ministers meeting and what it did was it's the it's the only one amongst all of those that actually includes a public private component and it sort of speaks to how practical the issues are around transport that you can bring in players who can actually speak to the initiatives that they're working on and so you know it was interesting to see how uh, the, the different federal ministers chose participants. So for example, uh, Pete Buttigieg from the US chose the mayor of Seattle, um, Mr. Harold, Bruce Harrell, to come and speak about the $50 billion that they're spending currently on transportation in terms of really dealing with the car issue uh, in, in Seattle. Similarly, your, the European Union told, chose Velocopter. And the reason they chose Velocopter is because they will be the first to deliver um, uh, aerial born cab service to the Paris Olympics. So they're right on the verge of having this, you know, very unique transportation. And, you know, it varied all the way from uh, what people are doing in terms of physical mobilities, uh, you know, down to the green corridor process. And so essentially what it was, was a round table a group gathered together at the center, uh, you know, part of the formal G7 structure, uh, and each each of the participants had the chance to present. So, you know, it's, it's interesting to see, I, I think because this idea has so much currency, you know, you heard a number of the ministers refer to the importance of green corridors. In fact, 
you know, just coming off it, and, and I wouldn't say it's us, but Pete Gep Buttigieg was talking about green corridors and the importance on the West Coast just within days of the session. And, you know, similarly, the Italian transport minister, you know, referenced it. So I, I think the, the great part about that is with that type of idea sharing, um, you, you really feel like you could start to build something very concrete. And of course, because we have so much relationship and involvement with Japan and South Korea, you know, these are occurring at pretty much all levels of government. So, you know, sat with the vice chair of Japan, and we had an honest discussion about it, but, you know, there's a lot going back and forth bilaterally there between the two, two nations. So pretty exciting. Very cool. Thanks for that. Uh, so we do have some questions coming in and just in the interest of uh, time and efficiency, I'll just try and uh, consolidate ones that are sort of similar or across similar themes, if that's okay with everybody. So um, maybe one, and this relates to a question that I also had in terms of, you know, there's obviously a lot of interest from industry and you've talked about, you know, customers of yours and other commercial partners who are, who are already involved. My question had to do with sort of what do you see now and I guess into the future as the role for government to play. And this sort of relates to a few of the other questions that came in in terms of, um, you know, are there existing barriers from a government perspective, whether that's policy or regulation that are limiting this or constraining it in any way? So maybe maybe we could start there. Yeah, so, so I, I think maybe two parts to that question. Uh, strong interest from government. And I, I think the, the interesting part of that, as soon as you start to involve organizations, we're used to doing, right? We're used to engaging. We know projects. We, we uh, you know, want things to occur and, you know, are also willing to engage in partnerships that result in capital spend. Now, the key thing, of course, that holds that back is, especially when you're talking about non-traditional fuels, ammonia being one, ammonia is a fuel you have to be very careful with. There are existing transportation networks for it, but it's not easy to transport and it has some danger to it. And so that whole process of permitting the facilities, per permitting you know, the, the, the Haber-Bosch process that's used actually in the creation of ammonia, being able to transport it in rail, are all things that are going to need to be permitted sequentially and receive strong government support. And of course, as we're all aware, that permitting process in Canada is slow. It's, it's slow all across the Western world, but this is not something easy. And so, you know, that push in terms of we need to engage in rigorous science to make sure we have the right regulations, but speed to permitting, incredibly important. And uh, so that, that I think is probably one of the number one things we're calling on all of, uh, you know, be it both provincial and federal regulations, we need to be able to move these projects on in order to engage in this type of nation building effort. At the same time, we've been pretty clear, we're asking for participation and we're asking for funding and we're asking for bilateral cooperation. So speed the conversations that you're having on a trade basis with other nations, uh, be willing to, to cough up money in the budget. I think there was about $150 million in there, most of which transport feels is going to terminals, you know, initially, but as this grows, I think there's further opportunities. And, uh, you know, also to act on a facilitation basis. So there, there's a strong role for both federal and provincial governments. Okay, terrific, thanks. Um, just again, trying to pull these together. Um, one question was, could you tell us a bit more about your partnership and engagement with shipping lines specifically in terms of low carbon marine shipping technology and investments? Yeah. So uh, it's interesting because, you know, there are ostensibly competitors within the consortium and they do, in fact, have some different approaches. You know, so uh, Japan in particular, you know, some of the finest vessel manufacturers in the world, highest quality uh, vessels coming from Japanese shipyards. They've been very, very active uh, in terms of both promoting and producing new engine technologies. Uh, you know, I was blessed, I think, to see uh, the schematics for uh, a, a produced or soon to be produced ammonia vessel, runs du dual fuel powered by ammonia, uh, ready to invest in. And so really, you know, we have strong interest and some lines are more progressive than others. Some are already actively engaging things like I didn't mention, but we have a flat and a rotor deal. So we're going to see a vessel that we engaged in a long-term COA on uh, come to Vancouver with three flat and rotors on it. That will be, I think the first in Vancouver, 
you know, others are doing similar things. NYK, for example, has a, a, a wind-based vessel that uh, they have in service for South America. So some are moving it forward. And, you know, I think what we offer is the ability to engage in some of those longer term agreements, but we're also very well known entities. So they, you know, have a strong desire to partner with us based on our volumes. But, you know, I, I do want to say, and I don't want to sound like I'm focusing on just bulk. We're pretty agnostic to what the final form for the corridor could be. We think it could involve different modes of transportation. Uh, and really, it's all about volume and consistency that helps it happen. So I don't think it's restricted in the future to bulk. I don't think it's restricted to one line. And I don't think it's necessarily restricted to one technology, though it does feel like ammonia is probably the front runner and would be the first in service in terms of non-traditional fuels. OK, terrific. Thanks. That addresses a, a handful of the questions that have come in, so that's great. Um, uh, an interesting question to the extent that uh, that you can uh, who else like not necessarily missing but if there if there are others and you mentioned that you're in discussions with others so it may be those groups but you know from a sectoral perspective or an industry perspective who else would you like to see involved that maybe isn't just yet so we decided in terms of alternate fuel producers that we would have the consortium essentially go out for an rfp to what will be the successful fuel producer and so there are a number of fuel producers that are engaged in this field and working very actively we didn't want that to be the center part of the consortium early because clearly they have a single commercial effort and we're aware of other green quarters that have been derailed by you know a single fuel producer this is the technology we're pushing and you know having essentially the receivers saying oh wait hold on a second this is just an effort to raise my fuel costs and ensure that you know you, you've got a reliable consumption of of the fuel you're going to produce long term so fuel producer is still to come uh, definitely, as I said, we were still engaged in discussions with, you know, other large shippers. I think personally that, you know, if we were able to achieve critical mass in the Pacific Gateway, for example, something like 30 or 40 percent of the overall volumes, people that are signed on to the consortium, that gets us right into the ballpark where we need to be. And so, you know, that's kind of the process. But at the same time, what we don't want to do is get so large that it's unwieldy. So that's sort of like, you know, 30 to 40% of the volumes, 12 to 15 major players. And then we'll keep the rest on an ancillary basis around. So, you know, some of the port authorities, for example, other terminals, bunker suppliers, you know, people who are providing on a consulting basis, uh, technology information, you know, keep that a bit at arm's length so that this, this work can occur efficiently on behalf of Canada. Terrific. Um, another one, slightly uh, different track. Um, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, but you know, you've described a uh, an overall approach to logistics uh, in terms of tech's work that's sophisticated. Um, not everyone is necessarily as synchronized or well organized. Do you? And again, you know, coming from having worked in this space for a long time, do you have kind of any initial thoughts for shippers of other commodities who maybe aren't quite so well organized but want to get there? And any yeah. advice? Yeah, you know, and, and and I hear this a lot. Well, you're so big, right? This gives you, you got lots of money, you're big. <laughs> like, yeah. That's a natural advantage, you know, not everybody. And I think, uh, you know, I'd encourage probably two things there. Part of it is standpoint and how you attack the problem. And part of it is also, you know, the, the way you're, you're choosing to approach it. And I think, you know, as we started mm -hmm. to bring in ESG thinking fundamentally into our approach to transport, you know, that uh, changed the way we acted. And similarly, when we started to bring reliability thinking in, you know, that also changed the way. And so, I, I, and this is not a knock on transportation professionals, but for many, you've sort of been stuck in, it's a cost equation and that's what the organization cares about. And that's how we get rewarded, you know, at the C table is, are you the lowest cost transportation? And I think honestly, sometimes, both ESG and reliability have suffered based on that. And I'm not saying it has to be more expensive. I'm just saying that we have to widen a bit our perspective on what's important in terms of our achievements. And you know, for us, it, it comes in sharp relief because you got a high value commodity. And as soon as you start missing it, that's even more damaging than your transportation costs. So maybe that's the part that's easiest for us. We know what we need to achieve, but for others, it's, you know, there's some more harder trade-offs to make. So 
I feel like I sort of skirted around it. I still no, no, there's, no, an there's an advantage to being big for sure, but yeah. um, I, I don't think that's that's everybody needs to say, well, we could never do that, you know? Right. Got it. Um, another question. Um, the corridor concept uh, has gained traction uh, over the past number of years for different reasons, whether that's transportation corridors, um, supply chain corridors, now green corridors. Um, and this relates to another question that I had had as well, just in terms of, you know, this is a 2050 kind of vision and plan. Um, and, you know, my question was around kind of where, where ultimately, again, having put so much effort into and seeing the, the importance of moving this initiative forward. Um, my question was sort of, where do you want it to get to? But um, this question kind of to build on that says, you know, is there value in bringing sort of these different corridor perspective, transportation, supply chain, green, and obviously they're all interrelated, but is there a role for maybe government to play together with industry? Like, is it about a, uh, and the suggestion here was a green critical trade corridor or something like it that kind of pieces things together that sounds, it sounds big uh, to bring together, but any views there? Yeah, I, I think that's exactly the way, right? The more that you can collaborate, the more that you can uh, bring multiple entities, I think, to solve the problem because so many of these are so large, right? You know, look at anybody who ships for the West Coast, I'd say we have a reliability problem, right? That, that's, that's, a, that's a gateway problem. And, you know, there are lots of factors that are contributing to it. And, you know, great, okay, tech's got an AI optimizer. Well, does that just mean you're selfishly optimizing your own traffic, right? That's not, that, that, that I don't think is to the detriment of anyone else, but it doesn't do anything to solve the overall problem. So I absolutely agree with that approach. And the, the problem is it's hard, you know, it's hard to be efficient. It's hard to agree on shared objectives, you know, all that stuff's tough. And, you know, uh, it, some of this, these things have been in place and worked in a certain way for a long time, you know, so you're also being pretty disruptive. Yeah, got it. Uh, another question, and I don't know if it's kind of too preliminary in the planning or not for this question, but I'll, I'll mention it anyways, because it's an interesting one. In terms of the traffic flow that you illustrated on that one particular slide, in terms of um, managing vessel arrival, is there a certain kind of system that's envisioned or, uh, you know, is that something to be detailed down the road? Big detail down the road, Phil. You know, we, we're, we're certainly, uh, you know, watching, for example, in Vancouver around ABTM and the introduction of, you know, that as a technology. And, you know, I think there's various degrees of concern or not concern with that. Uh, you know, we, we're pretty familiar with some of the other global terminals, you know, Rotterdam for, or global ports, Rotterdam, for example, uh, you know, some of the operations in Australia when they've got very high volumes and certainly the technologies are becoming more and more prevalent. So, um, you know, that that's one we're watching very closely. Another question, and this was specific to um, the CPKC uh, hydrogen locomotive. The yep. question was around, uh, will the coal trains to Vancouver use only hydrogen locomotives and uh, any sense for when that pilot is gonna start up? Yeah, I think this, this is a great question because the challenge with railways is interoperability, right? You know, you almost need to, uh, in, in a, whatever region, decide on the technology and understand that it's shared. Locomotives go back and forth between all of the class ones and down, you know, in, in various locations. So there was this challenge around, you know, can you run in the main loop? Do you need to just restrict to the yard what happens? And in that way, the coal chain is a bit unique. Uh, and that's because certainly from uh, origin at the mines uh, all the way out to Golden, we really are the most of the traffic there. And so the plan is from, from the mines to uh, one of the terminals to run uh, with the locomotives initially in a, a mixed consist and then ultimately in a pure hydrogen consist. And so we would, again, to take care of that complexity, run to one terminal, run back to, to the valley. And, you know, those, those locomotives would essentially remain in that service. So, you know, you don't have those challenges of interoperability or switching them, et cetera. So that took one level of complexity out of it. And, uh, you know, we're going to see certainly in 2024, uh, you're going to see active hydrogen locomotives running is my view. So CP's done an incredible job. I'm sure lots of people have seen what they've built there and, um, 
you know, just, I think it's extraordinary that within the organization, they're able to develop this. And, uh, you know, we're very excited. So, you know, working together on, on that process. Thanks. Um, this next one is a little bit more site specific, but since we've got you on the line, question was, can you describe the, um, the transportation system at uh, Red Dog? Yeah, <laughs> that's a great question. I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated that somebody is interested in that because it's kind of cool. So Red Dog, uh, you know, the, the world of zinc is interesting because zinc has a limited number of large producers and a limited number of large customers. And so, you know, it, it operates in a fairly traditional way as, as say uh, copper does or in, in comparison to copper. And at Red Dog, you have a unique constraint on top of that. So Red Dog is the, uh, I think in terms of size, it's one of the largest zinc producing mines in the world. Uh, it is a, amongst the most far north of operations in the world and it has a hundred day shipping season. And so it, it, for example, that season is about to open and it's a very, very interesting process. At Red Dog, we're partnered with Nana which is a First Nations corporation in the North. They've been our longstanding partner many, many years. Uh, and so part of the agreement that we have there is in order for the shipping season to open, of course, ice has to be clear. Uh, traditional foods have to be fulfilled, particularly the marine hunting season has to be concluded. And then we're given the go ahead to begin shipping. And so right about this time of the year, what you've done is you've move the vessels in place, they're ready to go. Arctic expertise provided there primarily by FedNav, amazing partner for long-term, they just have so much expertise up there. We have a lighterage system. So essentially because there's no deep water port, you know, based on the location, what we do is we have a loading facility at the shore, which is uh, the concentrate is actually trucked from the mine to this loading facility. That then is placed on what lighterage systems. So it's essentially two barges, the tech owns, and then FOSS out of Seattle takes care of bringing those barges alongside to the vessels and the vessels are actually loaded by barge. So very interesting lighterage system. The picture, I, I think that people saw at the beginning with the fantastic Northern lights and the vessel being loaded and the barges alongside it, that was actually red dog loading. So I can get a little romantic when we talk about that. It's pretty cool. And, you know, we had one picture last year of this just brand new first maiden voyage of a Japanese vessel being loaded by the barges right in that open Northern context. It's, it's pretty neat. And see, only transportation nerds would get excited about that. So, you know, maybe well, I'd be in the club. You know. There's at least one person on this call who's probably very happy with the last couple of minutes. So, thanks for that. <laughs> um, and maybe we've worked our way through. Maybe just a final question. And uh, it's a bit philosophical, but it's probably a good place to end. Um, you know, you've described a vision and a concept that involves competitors and is going to need to involve all different kinds of groups and organizations to be successful. Uh, the question was, what do you think leads to successful collaboration in the context of this? Well, so I think it's interesting and I'll, I'll take the words from uh, one of the proponents within uh, the federal government who said, you know, when we're looking at this sort of style of, of work, uh, that sort of openness, transparency and you know, essentially, it, you can see it in the not-for-profit, right? You have to have, create that facility to work together. And to some degree, you have to put aside some of those traditional concerns. Who would think that two competing ship lines, particularly with how competitive they are, would be able to sit down at the table? And so I think it's a lot about transparency. It's a lot about initial structure that facilitates it. It's thinking carefully about governance. So, you know, we'll, we'll, full disclosure, uh, in the early CAO session, we actually had BLG national law firm participate. They actually hosted us in Montreal. BLG then became an advisor in terms of the governance structure and did some very careful thinking with us about how best to set this up. So we went very intentionally in terms of the setup uh, in a way that we thought would generate max success. A lot of thought into that process. So we spent some time on it. Terrific. Well, I mean, a lot of that is obviously due you talked about tech as a catalyst and you've done, uh, you and the team have done a, a very impressive job of putting this all together. So congratulations. Um, I know that many people, including those on this call are gonna be interested to see where it all goes. Um, thank you again, Ian, for, uh, for making the time for this. Again, I know it's busy, so we really appreciate you joining. 
Um, thanks to everyone else who's taken a bit of time out of your day. We're giving you 12 minutes back, um, but uh, really appreciate your interest and, um, and stay tuned for more. Thanks, thanks everybody and have a great weekend. Happy Canada Day. Appreciate the opportunity, everyone. And feel free to reach out to me if, if you need to. I'm on LinkedIn and open for questions. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye.